Since 1957, Southlanders have been watching an island rise in Bluff Harbour. It's their new three and a half million pound island port, designed to be New Zealand's biggest outlet for lamb and wool. To raise the island next to deep water, a big suction dredge pumps silt from the harbour floor onto an ancient sandbank. The mud solidifies and foot by foot the island harbour grows, 84 acres on a firm foundation. At this stage the harbour entrance end of the island is being finished. There will be room for two coasters and three overseas ships as well as for the bluff oyster fleet. Three more berths will be built later. Railway and road traffic is separated from the mainland by a deep tidal channel. Rather than build a causeway and upset normal tidal flow, which could be disastrous, the harbour board engineer, Mr Mason, has designed a 200-yard bridge, nearly one chain wide. It's natural harbour development above everything, even if it does mean spine-chilling jobs for some. Up and up comes the outer sheet piling. It went down two years ago to protect the reclamation, but now its job is done. Soon the faithful suction dredge pumping up silt will make way for merchant ships coming in from all over the world. The present wharf can't be extended to cope with increasing production, so Bluff's new island port is vital to Southland's future. Cargill's very proud of its clean, wide streets. Digging them up seems like a crime, but 80 power cables must go down under the intersections. What can they do? Well, the engineers have a plan and a secret weapon. On both sides of the street, they mark out the pavements for digging. It's nothing like the old days. This makes it much more mysterious for the sidewalk superintendents who now ought to stand in the road. Aha! Here's the secret weapon. Looks like a piece of field artillery. Perhaps they'll shoot the cable across. No, it's more boring than that. It's a tractor-driven, auger-type horizontal driller. Let's hope nothing disturbs their aim. Never fear, the Invercargill Electricity Department is here. Nine times out of ten, they drill the target dead centre, making a six-inch hole right under the road. Traffic continues and the surface stays unbroken. And when they reach the other side, they widen the exit and push the pipes and then the cables straight through. Too much trouble, you think? Not for Invercargill. It takes less time and money, doesn't impede traffic, and makes a better-looking job. This is karting, go-karting, New Zealand's newest sport. Most people have a trolley when they're small, but these small races are more for grown-ups who want to play at motor racing. Over 200 enthusiasts, young and old, have already joined this club in Auckland, which introduced karting last August, straight from America. Costing 50 pounds to 150, depending on who you know, these pint-sized motor racers go like a greyhound, 40 miles an hour, three inches from the ground. So go, man, go! The 
the Dominion President of the New Zealand Pipe Bands Association, Mr. V. J. Nicholson, places a wreath on the cenotaph at Wellington. The unusual number of kilts and bonnets seen in the capital city is accounted for by the annual Dominion Pipe Band Championships. City of Wellington Pipe Band quick steps and weaves its way to victory at Hut Recreation Ground. It's 20 years since the Pipe Band Championships have been held in Wellington. At Athletic Park, the marching and playing of the massed bands thrills the large crowd. Today, the Scotsman's grandstands are all inside the turnstiles. Staff flourishing by drum major R.J. Binning, City of Wellington. Drum major Albie Souter, Scottish Society, in the Mackenzie Tartan, again wins the staff flourishing. In this, his final competition appearance. Pipe bands from Danavirk, Auckland and Hastings also took part in the display. One of the largest in the Dominion, the mixed band from Palmerston North. Drum major G. Sampson, Narawahia, in the Cameron of Erich Tart. presentation of the Challenge Cups, Shields and Trophies rounds off the 1960 Gathering of the Clans.